Nej, har Joe det? Wow, løb bag, ja. Hvor var det simp? Jeg tjekker i phones. Ja, men jeg sagde, hvad er det? You're still doing stuff for half an hour. Det er because I'm f***ing businessman, eller noget, jeg mener. Flipping hell. Checking your Tinder. Ja, yeah. <laughs> I've got Tinder, Hinge. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello one and all and welcome to Behind the Glass. I am your host Sam from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. And I'm Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. Yes you are. Uh, each week we get together we talk about cars, motorsport, F1, car, what else? Cars? Cars. We talk cars, cars, cars. cars. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can watch us on youtube.com forward slash Behind the Glass. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And Tony if people want to support this podcast what should they do? Watch it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but also head to Patreon. You can support us on patreon.com forward slash behind the glass. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoy the episode. So, I think we have to address it. Fuel prices. Yeah. I mean, real good time for me to buy an Audi RS6. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I am not driving the Range Rover anymore. One, because I've done too many miles in it and uh, I can't drive it. Because at some point you need to sell it. Yeah, I need Can't to sell, sell it. Oh, 75,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> One so, careful of <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, fundamentally, I was spending between 150 and 200 pound a week in diesel. So, uh, I'm in the van. I mean... I'm in one of the vans. I... So just Yes, I, I, all, I mean, I didn't know how thirsty the RS6 was before I bought it. Probably should have looked into that. We should have asked me, I'd have told you. Uh, good point. Uh, <laughs> didn't. Uh, no. I was like, oh, it's an RS6. Like, it's not going to be that economical, but who cares? It's an RS6. But I definitely didn't intend to buy one just as fuel prices reached a sort of record high. So it's, it's a bit painful. I think I'm averaging, well, in London, <laughs> I'm averaging 10 mpg. No, yeah, are you? I'm averaging 10 mpg in the city. Out on the motorways, I'm doing all right. I haven't hit 30 yet, but yesterday I got up to 27.4 as my average mpg. I had to drive down to Rye, East Sussex. So there and back, I averaged 24. I thought that was okay. Sorry, sorry 27.4. I thought that was all right. Um, but in, in London, it's around 10 mpg. You would have got to 30 if that was all motorway, by the way, but it, it's not. You've still got to get out to the yeah. motorway, haven't you? So yeah, yeah it's an average it's, journey. You, you, you were bad. It's painful, isn't it? It's painful. It's not the biggest tank in the world, so it's only it's cost me about ninety five quid to fill up. At the, actually, that's a lie. Yesterday, it cost me one hundred and eleven quid to fill up at one stage. But it's you know, it's it's not the biggest tank ever. So my best sort of range from a full tank has been around three hundred and sixty miles. Yeah, um, and that yeah, just uh, just goes so quickly. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it's happening around the world, but it's definitely happening here in the UK. Petrol prices are going through the roof. I think we're at sort of 170, 175 per litre at the minute. It depends where you go, yeah. But average sort of 160. This is for diesel, by the way. So average is sort of 164 to 174, depending on where you go. And petrol, a little bit cheaper. Oh, so I'm getting super unleaded at around 170, 175. Oh, right. Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, yeah, super unleaded. But, but normal normal petrol is kind of 155 to 1... E10. Yeah, Ugh. 160. Well, your car's all right for E10, mate. Uh, yeah, but, mate, I'm not a fan of this E10 thing. Now... What difference does it make? Well, it makes a lot of difference. What, what to you? Yeah, well, well firstly... your pocket, it does. Well, 7 p a litre difference. 8 p, 10 p a litre difference. Performance, when you get into the higher end stuff. You're just moaning about... Just hold uh, on. Uh, no, 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 no. What? I won't hold on. It does 10 to the gallon in London. You, yeah. you don't need performance then. And then on a run, no, no, wait. <laughs> on a run where you're going to be driving it in E mode, probably. Yep. Why do you need performance? You're, gonna, you're driving it at 20, trying to get 30 to the gallon. I meant, I meant perf- uh, efficiency. I would reckon with E10, not a joke, I would get nine in town. I have found E10 to be less efficient than E5, five, E5. Five? Right. <laughs> e but five, you're, but you're paying 12p a litre more. So if you lose a, if you lose ah, a mile per, you are not as maths. clever good, as you look. Good, Honestly. Good man maths. Well done. <laughs> oh, all that, t- yeah. all that money yes, spent my, on your my, school. My, my, my mum says that pretty much every <laughs> week. Oh God. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't think that through, did I? Well, okay. All I'm going to say is we have talked about the fact that we're keen for synthetic fuels or e-fuels or whatever you want to name Electric. It. Renewable fuels, etc. Electric. What, you're keen for electric? Well, at these prices, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, because- it's electric- getting more expensive as well, just FYI. Yeah, of course yeah. it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to continue to go up as well. Sure. Do you think it's actually, oh my God, have you just stumbled across this as a conspiracy theory? I mean, maybe the government are, are inflating fuel prices so we all buy electric. That's exactly why they're doing it. Because <sighs> because I don't think the, the short, I don't think we're suffering in terms of fuel demand because we don't get it from Russia. I think, so, I think Russia only, I think they only distribute 8% of the fuel around the world. I think I read that the other day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fact check this and we And we, we don't really get our fuel from Russia. So fuel's gone up. They're blaming it on the war, but that's not where we get it from. So of course, yeah. I mean, that, that's definitely been in the news a lot is that, is that petrol prices are increasing because of the war in Ukraine but, and the sanctions that we're putting on Russia and the fact that correct. we're now turning it away. So Russia is Europe's largest supplier of natural gas. We're not in Europe. Providing around 35% of the gas used across the continent. The UK's reliance on Russian gas is far less significant at just 3%. About half of the UK's gas comes from the North Sea and a third is sourced from Norway. The rest is made up of imports um, from places like Qatar and US, etc. Comes on a boat. Yeah, so the, the Russian... Uh, the, uh, 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 so yeah, okay, fine. Well, well g- good point. So the RSC is one... Oh, this is an old article now. Um, so yeah, so you're right. There's other factors going into why prices are increasing. I yeah. mean, they have been for a while before the war kicked <clears> off. <throat> prices were already starting well, to it was the fuel go Well, it was the fuel shortage originally. Shortage, shortage in inverted commas. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Which was started by... The Fear fuel memory. company, yeah. basically, BP, said that they were short of lorry drivers or whatever. So that was an excuse to put the fuel prices up and they never come back down. And now they're putting them up again, blaming it on something that... It's, it's just an excuse, mate, to hype prices. And this will be, I would think, government-led and um, because the fuel companies want to make some more money. And just for our international viewers right now, because we do have a, a ton of you, which I, which I love, um, to put this into sort of a dollar ratio, because you pay, I think they pay per gallon, don't they? Uh, no idea. Uh, hold on a sec. Um, US fuel prices. It's, I'm pretty sure it's different. Um, they don't do a litre. No, they don't do a litre. They do it uh, per gallon. Dollar Someone price. can tell us. Well, so yeah, so hold on a sec. So is it just times by four? So we're at 170, let's say one six, let's say 160 a litre at the minute for fuel well, here. There's about four and a half litres to a gallon, roughly. Yes, so hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> Live maths on the podcast, people. <laughs> 160 divided by 4.5, 35 cents a gallon. Is that right? No. Okay, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Someone help us out. What's, what's the... Tri- what's the tri- uh, how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, it's expensive. Usually, what would it's you say? It's gone up, though, in America, though, even in America. Of course, it's gone up around the world, yeah. but I'm just trying to sort of explain, because we obviously, everywhere, it's slightly different of how they present gas prices. Yeah. Traditionally in the UK, <sighs> or at least over the last couple of years, what, we're sort of 120, 130, maybe is more R- Roughly. Yeah, yeah, but like I said, yeah. But, but um, it's gone up to, and, and Europe, mate, uh, I got a message the other day. Um, Germany. Italy, Italy, it's over two euros. Germany, two pound fifty. Oh my, two fifty uh, euro. Maybe that was a, uh, a service station, yeah, but for V Power Racing One Hundred. But also, they do get some fuel from Russia. Well, yeah, as we read there, yeah, isn't it thirty percent? So, like that? yeah. So, well, look, it, it is making driving uh, pretty unaffordable at the moment. Only sorry, driving a combustion engine car pretty unaffordable at the moment, especially when it's an RS six. <laughs> oh, I'm, I am enjoying that. Can car, you get but, an electric RS six? I kind of want one. <laughs> I'm a bit like you. Well, you know what? I'm not. You can't, like you. can you? How much more money would it be? Sorry, we got cut off there for a second. You said, how much more money would an electric RS6 be? Yeah. I mean, I guess a lot more. I mean, yeah. how much is an Audi RS B- Tron GT thing? Yeah, 140 or more. They don't do an estate one. Yeah. Oh, uh, well. So uh, it's, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. It's been a bit of pill to swallow though, the last couple of weeks. Mm. As excited as I am to have that car, I'm like, eh, not great timing. So if we want to stop the fuel crisis, by the way, uh, the fuel price is going up, don't buy it. Don't so, buy fuel. Stop buying fuel. Mate, how are people going to get around? That's a Public stupid transport. thing to say. No, you're no, being no, ridiculous no. now. Get on a bike, get on a pedal bike, get an electric car. Get on a car. pedal bike. What if your commute, get an from, car. What if your commute is 200 miles a day? You're getting on a pedal bike? Get an electric car and be patient, really patient. What's wrong with you? No, no. What's happened? No, no, no. Because are you this drunk? Will, What's, this, is that vodka in there? What's this going will, on? This will stop 
the fuel people. It's all supply and demand. Stop, stop the stop the demand. It's, you're being unrealistic. No, I'm not. The UK people cannot stop filling up their cars. Of course, leisure drives. Well, they're going to have to. The minute they can't afford it. Well, yeah, that's a good point. But yeah. we're not going to be able to afford to heat our houses or turn our lights on it in a second anyway. But you cannot say to the UK people, if you want to bring prices back down, to stop buying fuel. But that's how, that's how we're going to bring it back no, down. No, no, but it's not possible, mate. Well, it should be. <laughs> if you but want them to come down, that's what you got to do. Just stop buying it. No. Well, you only got to stop buying it. It's, it's short-term pain for long-term not, gain. Yeah. <laughs> just don't do it for a couple of weeks. Sure. They'll sure. all panic. Okay, yeah. Bring it down to good one advice, pound mate. again. Good advice. As Great the audience advice. like to say, you know, you're always right about this kind of stuff, Tony. <laughs> you, so talk, you just talk straight so facts. Angry. You talk straight facts. <laughs> Sam, Sam is just not in touch with the world. Not Tony in the real world, no. Yeah, yeah, in a bubble of social media. Great advice from you. <laughs> Let me just sit on my coffee and think through what you just said. <laughs> Shall we move the conversation on? Yeah. Before you make more outlandish claims. <laughs> oh, um, I've got plenty more. I'm sure you do. <laughs> We're talking about cars that maybe don't have great fuel economy. Have you seen that Mercedes have upped their Formula One safety car game? It looks mega. So this year, 2022, uh, the safety car, when Mercedes have the their turn to use it, it's going to be the MGGT Black Series. <gasps> now this, I mean, this is cool and this needed to happen for a while. They've been running Properly the cool. MG GTR for a while. Did they, it wasn't the pro, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever stepped up to the pro. So it was the, the MG GTR. It's now going to become the Black Series and the medical car is the GT four door, which also looked super cool. So yeah, very exciting. All in a red livery. And then from the, for the Aston Martin races, it's still going to be a vantage in a DBX. I wonder if they're doing the DBX 707. Probably not. I think it's just the same cars from last year. Yeah, it? yeah. I mean, yeah. They're probably on like two year, three year contracts or something. Very exciting though. Because of course, you know, fundamentally it's a, it's a PR exercise from Mercedes. They do pay a ton of money to have, you know, the, to use their cars as the safety and medical car. Um, but it's a way of showcasing, you know, their, their AMG products. Black Series, probably not a car that they need to promote that much so i think it's cool that they've decided to do this i mean yeah, hardcore yeah. and extreme and i saw a lot of jokes going around being like it'd be funny when the Haas can't keep up with the safety car yeah but genuinely i mean like it, it's going to be the first time i think we've seen a proper really track focused legit supercar as the safety car yeah yeah for sure and, and always in f1 they are always moaning can the safety car speed up please can it speed up and i know it's like comparing a mini to a ferrari when you compare the speed of a, an f1 car to a normal a normal road car essentially because that's what it is um but this will help this this will help Definitely i mean help. yeah as you say i mean the formula one cars are still going to be going massively slow yeah, and they yeah. would just eat eat up an amg gt black series what i think will be interesting though is the disparity between a vantage f1 safety car race and a Black Series race, because as you said, there will be a genuinely large difference between the pace that a Black Series is able to go around the track compared to a bog standard Vantage. That's true. When it was GTR versus Vantage, it's obviously a very similar car, similar engines and, and you know, similar performance. Um, but yeah, this is suddenly going to make it very different in those in those racing situations. Well, that's true, yeah. So I'll be interested to see how, if the drivers pick up on that or, or talk about it during the races, I think they will be happier, as you say, and at least Lewis, if he's close, he can say, oh, I own one of those. <laughs> um, very, very cool to see you the way. Um, now, before we come on to my 296 GTB experience, we have to talk about another experience I had recently, which you're definitely going to sink your teeth into. It's my drive of a Carrera GT. Drive of a Carrera? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, we spoke oh. about this briefly as well. So, forever on this podcast, if you're a new listener, welcome. Thank you so much. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel if that's where you're watching or consuming the podcast. If you're listening, keep following on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. But if you're new, Tony has forever, I would say, lambasted or slightly talked down about the Carrera GT. It's not a car that you're particularly fond of. There's a few, mate, but yeah, that is one of them. The, the F40 is another one that I'm not particularly fond of, and people say it's the best car ever, but I'm just not fond of it. Well, I, and everyone's allowed their own opinion. Of you're course. also definitely wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to not according them. to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Carrera GT was one of those cars that I'd, I'd never driven. I think I, would, I had probably been a bit scared to drive. You know, for a long time, it was always held as being this quite terrifying 
thing, you know, like very skittish, quite uncontrollable. It would snap very easily. It had few driver aids. The clutch was sort of hard to use. And I think I was just a bit wary of, of getting in one. I definitely didn't want to get in the passenger seat of one because I thought, oh, you know, you've heard too many horror stories about these things crashing. And I just, well, I just hadn't really been given the chance to get behind the wheel of one. So I have to say a huge thanks to the Octane Collection who said, look, yeah, come come check one out. Come have a drive if you'd like. Uh, it wasn't the perfect day to do so. It was a little bit damp, a little bit greasy out there, but they were absolutely fine with me having a go, which I have to say was amazing of them. And um, I would say it exceeded my expectations. Good. Is it, that because you've been listening to me? So how bad they are? Yeah, maybe. Maybe I'd let your sort of your... your uh, crap talk my influence <laughs> yeah infiltrate my mind slightly but no i think i always knew it was going to be a very cool car um but because of the things like you know the clutch was tricky to use and uh, and just various other bits and bobs i just sort of thought oh maybe it's not going to be that exciting and maybe it's going to be a bit too much of a handful um but no it was brilliant uh once you get up and running so just to explain about the clutch in case oh well, i'm sure everyone knows but just in case you don't it's got a it's got a very narrow clutch within the actual, you know, engine Biting bay. point. Well, yeah, so the window for the biting point is tiny because that's your clutch plate is very narrow and it's got a minuscule flywheel. This is all about aiding not only the weight of the car, making it lighter, but also the free revving nature of the car. That V10 engine, it's unbelievable how it revs. If you blip the throttle, the way that the rev counter or the revs go up and then down is nuts. Like, yeah, yeah. The minute you come off the throttle, the revs drop immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got this tiny little sort of window for the biting point. So you've got to really come off the clutch very, very carefully, allow the car to start rolling naturally, and then take your foot fully off the clutch and then engage the throttle. If you try and sort of blend throttle and clutch, that's when it all starts to go wrong. You'll probably burn the clutch quite quickly. You might even knock into anti-stall. Like it's just, it, it makes it complicated. So roundabouts, junctions, pulling away, not that great. Um, you know, you've got to kind of really think about it. But once you're up and running, you're fine. But yeah, things like rev matching, heel and towing, not that straightforward because of how quickly things, rev, like how quickly it drops and rises in the revs. Um, also, one thing that was playing on my mind is because it revs so quickly, I was very aware that if we'd hit any kind of bump in the road, maybe touched on a sort of greasy or a wet patch, and the wheels had lost traction, I genuinely think they would have spun up so quickly because of how quickly that car revs. And that's when we maybe would have got into trouble. And I experienced it in the passenger seat when we were headed to go out and film. It's a little bit too much acceleration on a greasier patch. Suddenly we were, you know, 45 degree angle. Yeah. I think that's why people get into trouble so quickly because it's just, it is just a monster. It's a, it's a really honed in motorsport derived product, yeah. which is really all about the engine. The engine yeah. is definitely the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the highlight of the car. But I found the gearbox super nice to use once I was up and running. Very smooth, very, very comfortable, great positioning. And because it's a Porsche, everything is well positioned. Visibility is fantastic. You sit super nicely, pedals, steering wheel, everything is, is ideal. And it's just a very pure driving experience. Mm -hmm. Are you going to this day set a lap time, uh, you know, a set a lap record? Oh, what am I trying to say? Are you going to light up the lap? charts am yeah, I, yeah am yeah. i making yeah, sense yeah you're, you're making complete sense. sense yeah yeah. you know fine but it's not really about that it's about the experience about the connection you can have with the car it's about the fact that there feels like there's very few computers in the way that you are totally in control of it and the fact it's a bit scary it just makes it such an enjoyable experience yeah i mean i completely get what you're saying and if that's what you like in a car fine no problem i don't like that in a car and you know, some people say, oh, it's because you like electrics and you like this. You can turn them off, the electrics. You've got the option to have them on or off, first of all. Um, and and I, I just like things to be perfect. As in, in general, I just like things to be perfect. It's not by... And, and no problem. It's just, for me, it's not by any means perfect. And the big, the big thing that I can't get over is the the perceived values of them. As in, they are extortionate, mate, for what they are. Yeah, they're like this special car, and I agree with the engine and the engineering. I completely get it. But when they are 100 grand, 200 grand cheaper than a 918, I mean, that is a joke. When you And I know it's, it's the manual purest car... You can't drive it properly because you're going to die. 
<laughs> well, no, I think if well, you got, just said it's if difficult you've got to drive. Skill, yeah, yeah, but if you've got some skill, mate, I, that, I had a 30 minute driving opportunity. Yeah. First time I've ever driven it. But the guy sitting next to me, Lucas from Octane Collection, who really can drive, has driven it for many, many miles and has really bonded with it and figured out how to drive it. And of course, you always have to be alert and be aware, just like you have to be in a 599 GTO and F12 yeah, yeah, TDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's plenty of cars out there which bite your head off if you don't respect them. And that's what I, I love about those cars. You know, I think having a bit of fear, hey, a pista is the same. A pista will happily kill you. You've yeah, got to, yeah, yeah. You've got to be aware of what you're driving. And that's what it is with the Carrera GT. But I like the fact that you can't just jump in it. A 918 Spider, first time I got in it, I jumped in and I was at what I felt like 10 tenths straight away. Yeah. No questions asked. I was yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm away, I'm done. And the same with the GT2 RS. Just get, off you go, done. Yeah. Where I had to really think about what I was doing with the Carrera GT. Two things I'll pick up on what you said. Firstly, you can turn off the electrics. You can't. Can't turn off electric steering. Can't turn off brake by wire. Can't turn off electric paddle shifters. You know, there's, okay, fine, traction control and stability control that you can dial down or in some cases turn off. But there's a lot of other electronic elements that cars now have, which you can't, that fundamentally are not analog, they are digital. And that's just the way that cars have gone and fine. So the feeling, the sensation, mechanical versus digital is different. And of course. As you say, you, you embrace it, you're happy with it, you like it, you like the feelings, you like what engineering has developed into, totally fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally like a more pure feeling of you know mechanical steering and 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 whatever I just said. Yeah, yeah. Manual gear shifting, etc. Et um secondly, value. So this was really the whole part piece around, you know, my video was focused around these values because in America especially, it hasn't really happened in the UK yet, I have to say, but in America, Carrera GT values have been going insane not only in the last two years in the last six months mm, like the real low mileage cars though the ones that i've seen yeah oh yeah they're like real, 280 miles like you yeah know, like basically yeah. delivery mileage yeah, cars of course yeah, but they're, yeah. they're fetching like two mil so you know there was a car that i think had five or six thousand miles on the clock and it was at like a 1.3 million dollars still a ton of money yeah and they are still going through the roof as i say it's happening a bit in Europe. It's not really translated onto the UK market yet. But what's 1.3 million in UK pounds? 850? No, 900 it's, grand? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's around a mil, actually. The, right. the Unfortunately, oh, maybe 900, actually. Yeah. The translation's not quite wide. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but that's not translating, I don't think. The Octane Collection car was a very nice example. I think it's up at around 900. Um, I'll be interested to see what happens because I actually think probably in the UK, they're still at sort of six or seven realistically for if you want a sort of a quick sale not to hang around i mean i that's my guess and estimate so we've got a while to catch up with the u.s market but fundamentally prices have been going through the roof and i justified it in the sense that it kind of has to because of its rivals of because where it sits where where it sort of fits into recent history so yes against the 918 how can a carrera gt be the same value or similar or similar price as a 918 how can a an enzo be the same price as a laferrari um a, how can an f40 be the same price as a laferrari an f40 is not the same price as a laferrari no. two mil since when two mil f40s two since mil. when since the last year yeah i mean that's just just ridiculous because they were 900 grand 18 months ago so, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's up, listen. 1.5 million euros, okay. Yeah, so. Still, they're still, still they're still. My, they're still. My, my point being, I get, you You can't really compare old and new because that seems to have gone out the window. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, values are just so insane. But if you look at Carrera GT's rivals, which you could say F40, F50, maybe, um, McLaren F1, uh, a little bit prior, but still, um, Merchelockers, SVs definitely aren't doing that well, but I don't think what else is in that sort of space. But the sort of the ultimate analog supercars, poster hypercars from the 90s and early noughties, they're all there. They're all on their way. Yeah, yeah. So why should the Carrera GT not? And if anything, with the sort of Porsche cult growing day by day, it should have almost been there a long time ago. Like the values of should have, you know, should have been there a long time ago. I agree with you. I think that's a 350 grand car. To me, a Carrera GT makes sense at 350 grand. I'm like, okay. You know, I, I get why it's that kind of money. One, one with some miles. I mean, I mean, if you've got a delivery mile one that's UK registered and got proper history, always been serviced at Reading and blah, 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 then, yeah, it, you know, you can command whatever your money you like because there won't, there won't be many cars like that. But 30 and 40... 
thousand mile cars, I, I I just can't get my head around that people are advertising them at eight and nine hundred grand. I mean, fair play if they get the money. I mean, you know, you got you got to find these people. I, I, I'm not against anyone trying to get the best they can for their car. I couldn't care less. I wouldn't give that money for one for sure because that it's not. I it doesn't light my fire essentially. So as a comparison. I would 100% have an F12 TDF over a Carrera GT, for sure, 100%. So they're similar values. Well, okay, absolutely. So, But the, here's the thing, right? So <laughs> inherently we're talking about, we're now, we're now entering this wider conversation of used and modern classic values and, and used values in general. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to realise you can't necessarily bash Carrera GT values and then not bash as I say, Enzo or F40 or give me some more examples, McLaren F1s or whatever, because that's just the way of the world. They become collectible sought after items for what they represent, the story behind them, their importance within the world. F12 TDF, don't forget, we're trading at a million pounds at one stage. Okay, yeah, yeah. fine. They might've dropped down to 600 or 700 now. They've, they've sent from back up again, but it's always everything. But, but, but yeah. that's still an extortionate amount extortionate. of money for what that car is. Yeah. And so that's, so my thing is, as a car, as what it can do, what can it achieve, where it sits in the kind of uh, pantheon of automobiles, mm. uh, I, I see the Carrera GT at around 350 grand. I think that kind of sits right. Over and above that, it's a collector's item. It has become a collector's item. You're paying not just because of what the car is capable of doing, etc. You're buying, you're paying the money, the premium, because it's a collector's item. Yeah. And, and as well... Uh, Another thing, the difference between a Ferrari and a Porsche as well, uh, you know, a good low mileage Ferrari is always far more collectible than a good low mileage Porsche in terms of values because we just know that Ferrari as a brand just commands more money because normally people have got an F40, they've got an F50, they've got an Enzo, they've got a Laf, they've got other cars as well and they go into collections and they're the the best examples in general, they've got no miles on them or very little miles. And that these people have had these cars from new, or if they haven't had them from new, they've gone and sought after the, the best cars available, essentially. When you've got not UK, not proper history, been serviced by someone, an independent specialist, why are these cars commanding proper money? They're not proper cars. From my, from my, mm. and you can't compare that to an F forty that's been. I know they're similar eras, mate, but they're not. They're not really in the same value bracket because of the because of the mark because of the the actual brand in general. You're you're, you're definitely right. There's a bad snobbery where Porsche don't have a history of making these big special sort of hypercar s cars, you know, Ferrari, every single Ferrari that comes out is theoretically looked at as a sort of collectible item. Um, and, and I'm having mind blanks as sort of other comparisons because we're literally just only referencing Ferraris. But there wasn't many back then, you sure, see. So yeah. there wasn't many to compare to now. You're totally right. But uh, at the same time, I think as, as cars become more and more collectible, people are willing to look past... The, uh, examples will range, values of things will range depending on their history. So yes, a high mileage car that's been looked after by an independent that's missed some service history, that's got documents missing, is never going to be as valuable as one that has got delivery mileage and, and whatever. Of course Of not. course. But that bunch, if you're looking at 150 grand to 400 grand, as the 400 grand car becomes a mill, the 150 grand car becomes 700 grand. They just do all move up yeah. as a bracket. You, you're going to have the lowest priced version, you're going to have the top priced version. The car, the actual fundamental car, is becoming collectible. Yeah. That's the thing. And, and but I, I, I slightly disagree because I think the collectible ones have already been sma snapped up by proper collectors that have got... But what do you call a collectible car? Like one with real proper history all the way through from start to finish. I've got a very good friend of mine works in finance. I told you about this car. He's yeah, got a yeah, 900 yeah. mile Carrera GT that's been serviced. Every, he'd never driven it. Ne he's never turned a wheel in it. It gets trailered to Reading every year. And he just literally, it's an investment, basically. And he bought it as an investment. And that is, it, 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 I don't know a better example than that car. It's a UK registered car. Um, it's always been serviced at Reading. 
it goes on a lorry. It is a bit of a waste of a car, but I understand what why he's doing it because he paid a certain amount for it a few years ago and he's expecting it to increase in value, which it will because it is it is the best available. But when you've got higher mileage cars that are not much less than that or not on the market for much less than that, I don't think the proper collectors are buying them cars. I think it's speculators buying them cars that that are, are waiting for the market to to do that. And, and, and it may happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. But me, being the person that I am, I would always try and give all... We had this conversation <laughs> briefly last week, but I would always try and get the best example with the best history, especially if it's, a, if it's an investment. Because you've always got a better chance of selling it, by the way, as well. For sure. But I think for me to top and tail this chat, I think the Carrera GT as a car, as with any car, Mercedes SLS over the last few years, um, Lexus LFAs, I don't know, like uh, the car is increasing in value because the collectors, like your mate, are willing to pay more for the best examples Mm -hmm. and the drivers, the enthusiasts, are willing to pay more for the worst examples. So... As I say, that window of whereas five years ago you were 150 grand to 350 grand, yeah. 350 grand being the best example, 150 being the worst, that window is increasing because at both both ends of the spectrum, people are willing to, expected to, and asking to pay more money. Yeah, for sure. And, and ultimately, it's the market that dictate the, that dictates the value. I, d- I don't know what Octane have got their car up for sale for, um, but... <laughs> What is what they sell it for is what it's really worth. Yeah, well, exactly. You, you exactly. know, you can put it up for whatever you like, but if the phone don't ring, then yeah. you've got to reduce it, or you, you know, I, 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 I don't know whether it's their car, whether it's a sale of return car. Is it the owner trying to get his money back? Maybe he thinks he's given too much money for it, and he's giving it to Octane to. But th- we we can't base sell. it on one particular car. Well, we like, can. This, this, we no, can. but this is a mar- this is a market. This is a, in general uh, talking about the US alone. In general, in the US. Carrera GTs are selling for these numbers. Mm. We know it at auction, mm. let alone not even private sales. Mm. So we we know for a fact in America, Carrera GT values are going through the roof. Yeah, but they'll have they'll have the same the same criteria as us. You know, we, we don't know the history of them cars. Maybe they're they're the same. They're proper one and two owner cars with four American in history an, and American well, supply cars. We're going around in circles here. No, we're not because, because we can't in the compare. US, the top cars are two million and the bottom cars are one point three. Two. Dollars. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, whereas a couple of years ago, pounds, yeah, but but wait, a couple of years ago, the top cars were one million dollars and the bottom cars were five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is the Carrera GT has been increasing in value. I can as agree. a bracket, the, yeah. the top cars are always going to be the best. Those are going to be the collector cars. The the worst cars, are gonna, but as a bracket, that car is increasing in value yeah. because, as I say, and uh, as I try to sum up, because it ha- sort of has to because of the other cars in that bracket. If you are a collector of modern classics, last great analog supercars, you've got your F40, you've got your F50, you've got McLaren F1, you've got Mercy SV bar, you go, right, now I want the Carrera GT. Mm. You're going to start pushing those prices up. That's, that is what's going to happen. Well, another thing as well, we don't actually know what they're selling for in the UK. We no, know no, what people that's are what I'm saying. That's why I talked for. about the US. Yeah, Because yeah, at yeah. the minute, that Octane car is the only car on the market. So it's almost not worth talking about the UK because we can only go on the US numbers where we know cars that have actually sold at those numbers. Uh, yeah, because they've been sold through auctions and stuff. Exactly. But, but again, the American market market isn't the UK market. It's like Totally agree. It's like a, a, a left-hand drive GT3 in Europe. You can get one tomorrow. Yeah, for uh, sure. You know, this is why Tim went over to uh, Europe and got his one. You can't get one for love nor money in this country and they're 80 grand over list because it's a right-hand drive car and there's far less of them than there is than there is left-hand drive cars. Different markets, 100%, which is for sure why I clarified, you know, it's the US market that's been blowing up and the UK, I so don't So I don't think, think you can compare the market. I, 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 you can't. I, the UK market hasn't blown up at the same yet because we don't have the history, yeah. we don't have the numbers, but fundamentally over the last five years, Carrera GTs have gone up in value. That That is the bottom line. I, I, I agree. We just don't know to what extent, but we do know in the US. And that's the interesting the, yeah. the piece is, uh, or at least why I was trying to talk and about. And in the UK, they, they, they would have gone up, but we actually don't know by how much. Yeah, exactly. Because, we, we have no idea. Because 
I've never sold one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, you know, well, we don't have the auction results that we do from the US. We don't have the sales because the cars aren't coming to the market. Yeah. We don't have the sale history. We can't analyze it like we can with the US when there are these big auctions. When you can see the numbers, you can see the cars, you know the buyers, then it's very easy to analyze. More of them in the Euro- US as well. They would have got the biggest allocation. Mm-hmm. So there would have been... There would have been Less cars here, which is why you sometimes see. I think there are only thirty nine cars in the UK. I think. Yeah, so you know. Yeah. So, but that's why you sometimes see it, like um, DK Engineering, and you know they'll get a car in, and it's a German car, or mm-hmm. uh, you know it's come from Switzerland or something like that. It's not a, a UK yeah. supplied yeah. car, so um, yeah, you know that th- they'll know what the true values are because they sell them. You know, these dealers that, that sure. sell them, that's what they'll, they'll, they'll know the values of them. I didn't mean to talk about Carrera TTs for 20 oh. minutes. <laughs> I've got to be honest. It definitely wasn't my intention. You want to start again? Be- no, 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 no. <laughs> definitely not. It was just going to be a brief recap of their awesome oh. experience and we really got into it there. But, well, I mean, hopefully you found it interesting insight us analysing Carrera GT values. I think fundamentally not agreeing, but um, <laughs> it was an interesting discussion anyway. Let's move on to something else. Um, do you have fun? No, yeah, I don't, I oh, God, I don't think we, we, we didn't agree. I just, uh, you know... I just wouldn't buy one. It's as simple as that. With for the values that they are, and we talk about this all not just Carrera GTs. We talk about car values, and you've done it with your daily car, mm-hmm, by the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you get to a certain amount of value of money, you start looking around at other cars that mm-hmm. are around that money. Mm-hmm. And when you look at a Carrera GT that's advertised at seven or eight hundred grand, mm-hmm. you then think, flipping hell, mm-hmm. I can have that, and I can have get? that, and I can have that, and I can have that. Fair, totally so, fair. That's why. Okay. Happy? Right. Got your last words? Out? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, Ben, can you cut this? Can you <laughs> <laughs> the 59 second clip, make sure you get me at the end this week and not him. If it's you not don't, fair. If you don't know, Tony does have to win every conversation. He, I could see you were foaming at the mouth to get that last statement in. You thought I was going to move on. You were like, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't said quite my finished yet. I haven't said my bit. No, I'm glad I let you get that out. I'm and, so uh, pleased. My headache's gone and yeah. everything. Oh, well done. Uh, are you, are you, can we move on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about what we were supposed to be talking about for 20 minutes of this episode. The 296 GTB. Oh, well, I mean, you're going to have to leave because I've not driven it yet. But, did you um, watch any of the videos earlier this week? Uh, yeah. Who did yeah. you watch? I saw the Top Gear one. Okay, nice. Um, And I watched a little bit of the Evo one. Okay, great. But then who, presented the, who presented the Evo one? Do you remember? Uh, you don't remember? No. No, I, don't, I didn't see the Evo one. Um, I watched all the Top Gear one. Okay, so yeah, earlier this week, the global press embargo lifted, which essentially is a date where we t- we spoke about this, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago, where Ferrari said that no reviews, no moving images of the 296 GTP were allowed to be posted anywhere in the world until Monday the 7th of March. Mm. So as of midnight, suddenly we've got this influx of content uh, around the 296 GTP. I decided to not go on uh, live with my content on the embargo date because I was like, who's going to watch me into the top gear? So, so I've waited a couple of days and put out a video about going to buy coffee in one instead. Uh, classic, seen through glass. But it's, but, it, but it's perfect, mate. Well, I hope so. I mean, because we'll, it's different. We'll, we'll find out. Li- literally, as of time of recording this episode, my video went live an hour ago. How's it going so, on? Well, should we check this? I don't want to do this. This could ruin, <laughs> this could ruin my day. Two K. <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this could really ruin my day. No. Um, uh, uh, is it all right? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, slightly ruined. It. Anyway, Dan, thank, thanks, YouTube. We had a nice time. Oh, we're going to have a Did time. you have a nice time? Yeah, anyway, I had a nice oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um, unbelievable experience. Huge thanks to Ferrari for the invite. I'm not really sure how I ended up on that drive because it was me, Shmi, <laughs> fine. Henry Catchpole from Carfection, Rory Reed from Auto Trader, Jason Barlow, who writes for GQ and, and does bits with Top Gear as well. Um, who else was on my rotation? The guy from the Daily Mail. I mean, they're pretty big, proper yeah, 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 auto yeah. journalists. And I was like, oh, hey guys, what do you think of the Carrera GT? <laughs> 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 so yeah, a lot of pressure. I, I felt under it, but um, but it's still an amazing experience. And they flew us down to Seville in Spain. And this was the first international media drive that didn't happen in Italy. Mm. Um, pretty major for Ferrari, but an amazing experience. The car itself, to this day, still not convinced how I feel about the looks. Okay. In the flesh, when I first saw it at Finale Mondiale last year, I was like, oh, it looks the bomb. Yeah. Spending a day with it, not so sure. Okay. I think the Assetto Fiorano car looks much better with the broken up uh, paint, but the actual all red car they gave us, I was not convinced by the looks. 
sitting inside it, it does feel like an evolution of F8 Tributo. The interior cabin, not, you know, the Roma SF90, uh, they have these brand new sort of cabins, really exciting places to sit. It didn't feel like that. It did, did just feel like a sort of F8 with some new screens and things like that. So that slightly disappointed me. Interestingly, because of the battery placement, which is right behind the seats, you know, the sort of traditional shelf that you've always yeah. got. So if you don't know, in f- mid-engine Ferraris, I think since the 355 or at least the 360, you've always had a bit of a shelf. Put some luggage. Yeah, behind the seats. Um, so you can put some luggage or put things on. It's actually always been very helpful. They've retained that, but it's kind of grown a bit because that's where the battery is essentially. So weirdly, I couldn't get my seat as far back as I I was going to say, so if you've got less cabin room now. I'm sure there'll be some measurement out there where they'll tell you you don't. But just as a sort of gut instinctive feeling, I was like, I wanted to get the chair back. Did you have enough leg? leg Yeah, I was comfortable. Headroom? Yeah, I was very comfortable. I was very comfortable. But if I could have, I would have gone back a smidgen. All right. Um, So... I thought you got this with the SF90. Apparently you didn't. So people were correcting me in my video as we talk. On the steering wheel now, on the right-hand side, you have the traditional Manatino. Uh, wet, sport, race, CT off, everything off, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That, that, well, that, well, that's the conventional that's the traditional one. one yeah. Yeah. So on the left now, you don't have a Manatino, but you've got four buttons to control the battery deployment. So you have a, you have a full E mode. So you're driving around just on the battery. A hybrid mode, which is aimed towards efficiency, where it's using the battery to aid in efficiency. Performance mode, where it's combustion engine and battery deployment to uh, focus on performance, where it will also recharge the battery when you're not using the maximum output. And then qualify mode, which is everything in one big go. So that's, that's all the power, all the battery. But because of that, you're sort of depleting your battery as you're using it. So you'll only probably get that maximum deployment for, I don't know, if they say like a, a lap and a half of a track or, uh, you know, a five minute blast. Down right, so let's get this right then. Let's get this right. So the car is engine 660 horsepower, 670 horsepower-ish. E6, yeah. With a 200, 150 horsepower electric motor. Yeah, not quite. I think it's around 135 or something. Or maybe it's 160. Oh God, now I've forgotten. But yeah. Around that. Around. Let's go with the around. So, correct me if I'm wrong, you only get the full 830 horsepower when everything's off? No, when you're in qualify mode. Actually, I don't know if you have to be in, like, race. I think you can be in anything on the right. I think you can be in sport. Okay. Or maybe you have to be in race. But, yeah, qualify mode is maximum output, right. 830. But that is, that is for a limited amount of time. Right. Because you are utilizing all of the battery for maximum performance, you're right. not getting much regen capabilities. Right. So therefore, your maximum 830 horsepower is on a limited So what amount. happens with performance mode? So if you're on performance mode, you drop around 30 to 50 horsepower. They were a little bit vague in the media briefing. In the SF90, it's 50 horsepower less. So in the, in the 296, they were a bit vague, but they reckoned around 30 to 50 horsepower. You're running in performance mode. And that's to ensure basically longevity of the performance. Because you're doing regen as well, it means that you're getting 700 and... Uh, seven, well, 770. Eight, yeah, 770, 800 horsepower yeah, yeah, yeah. consistently. Yeah. For basically as long as you want to go. Right. Where right. qualify mode is just that. It's like turning everything up in a Formula One car. It's all out power. Okay. Now... If you're about to sit there and go, well, that's a bit of a scam and that's bull crap. No, that isn't what I'm going to say. Okay, well... well, <laughs> <laughs> I just need to... Cause yeah, I understand it. Yeah. I, I didn't understand the, the full modes either because I'd like this car, by the way. Yeah, okay, well, interesting. So, uh, that is not a negative. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think in the, in the media briefing the night before, a lot of the journalists really picked up on this and they were really starting to go in and really trying to analyze this. Yeah. When you're in the car, at no point do you think, oh, oh, it feels a little bit held back. I wish I could unleash that. I mean, it's it's 800 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. Um, The car is so undeniably quick that you just, you you don't feel left wanting it. Um, But so is an F8 Tributo, by the way. Yes, very good point. (laughs) Um, Okay, well, I uh, I don't know how to jump into all this. But yeah, so so don't really worry about that, essentially. What I would say is, buying a Ferrari... I would run all the time in performance mode because you're regening the battery, you're getting performance, and it leans towards combustion engine use. Hybrid mode, I actually didn't like. Okay. So obviously it's trying to push you towards E mode most of the time because of efficiency, but you're not really regening. I mean, it regens every now and again, but not really regening the battery. 
But because you go from electric mode to loud V6, when the engine kicks in, you're like, it's, it's a bit of a shock and it doesn't feel that natural. And again, when you're driving and it cuts back to E mode, like I just didn't gel with that. But part that's of hybrid it. cars, mate, in general. That's how they behave. Lexus, Lexus is the. Well, which is fine if you're yeah, in a Mercedes yeah, yeah. S Class yeah. hybrid. But in a Ferrari, I was a bit like, oh, bought like. Ball Stop off. it. So yeah. I think I would just always be in performance personally, which is how, how I ended up driving the rest so of the So you're day. not saving the world at all? When I, you are because you're emissions, firstly. Right. But is that your overall it, emissions but, is what I mean. Yeah, but is that because it's a V6 and not a V8 anymore? Or is that, that because... Both. Everything. You're using... But you, but, uh, the, the emissions rating in comparison to an FH Tributo is just better. Yeah, it's because a cleaner of the v- engine. Because of V6 V6, V8. yeah. And also the particulate filters and everything that they've developed. Oh, yeah, fair. It's just a cleaner, cleaner yeah, engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, in performance mode, it does still knock you. You do still, you, you're still using the battery. Like, it's still there. So anyway, so long story short, that's how I preferred it. Henry Catchpole made a really interesting point, which he summarised in his video. Does the car actually need the hybrid tech? Now, in 2022, yes, it does. <laughs> but... A 660-odd horsepower V6 Ferrari. Actually, I think plenty. That that engine was fantastic. For me, almost stole the show was the engine. Yeah. Sounds the bomb. Yeah. Great grunt. Real nice performance. Yeah. A- everything that you would want from a Ferrari, mid-engine yeah. Ferrari. So plenty of power. The weight is a bit of an interesting one. The hybrid systems add 130 kilos to the overall weight of the car, but the V6 is lighter. So the car is about 30 kilos heavier than an F8. But therefore, it could be 100 kilos lighter than an F8. Yeah. And can you imagine a shorter wheelbase, lighter F8 with a stonking great V6 engine? What a car. Crash. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so the height thing's a bit weird. Like, I don't think I really gelled with it. I mean, when you're really crashing on, uh, cracking on, sorry, of course you're getting the added performance of instant torque of E-mode and all these different things that the battery are adding. And yes, there's the fundamental that you're helping with your emissions when you're driving around in E-mode or hybrid mode, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it, it's the new world we live in. Ferrari had to do it. Well, they're probably gearing up to do it, mate, because in 2030 or 2035, they've got to do it. So why, well, there's what, already pressures for them. They have to do it. You for know? sure. But, but what I'm saying is, is that why not do it now and get it absolutely perfect? Because we do know that the SF90 isn't perfect. Sure. Um, so why not get all these little niggles out now and then when 2030 or 2035 comes, when, whenever they've got to build full electric or hybrid cars or whatever, then the, the tech's there and it's perfect. Yes, you're right. You know, they've got to get cracking on with it. And yeah. I, I, say, I, I, don't, I don't blame them for that, but it, it, I don't know. I just, I didn't walk away going, God, hybrid Ferrari, what a thing. I sort of more went like, what a cool car. So the hybrid part, I think Henry, Henry said a good point, which was like, do they really need the hybrid part? It's there, but do you really need it? Yeah, but do you really need it on a laugh? But it's no, there. no, for, exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, it's just one of those things. It's just an observation. It's yeah. just an interesting observation. Um, sounded amazing. Car sounded amazing. They do it. It was a bit like the sort of old LFA tech. It's done with like a basically a hot tube that takes sort of noises, I think, from the back of the car around the exhaust like that to sort of funnel noise into the cabin. It's not synthesized. It is real noise. It's just really... Outside? Uh, What's it like outside? Sounds like any new Ferrari. Okay. So it, sounds, it sounds a bit like an F8. You know, yeah, it just sounds like a new Ferrari. Fairly muted, right. but good, good yeah, tone. Yeah. Like, so I got out to film a flyby once, I pulled over the side of the and I can hear the car coming from a while away. Okay. But it's that very, it sounds very similar to an F8. Okay. Um, from the outside, even though it's the V6 engine. Because uh, the F8 is loads quieter than a Pista. Yes, of but, course. Or a 488. For sure. But you so, know, because of the filters and the way that they use yeah. it, there's only so much you can do. But inside the cabin sounds the bomb. Okay. Um, Interestingly, steering-wise, I thought it was going to be really skittish. They kept banging on about the fact it's got the shorter wheelbase than its predecessors. Was it? Is it normal, quick Ferrari steering? Really direct steering As and quick. Are. But I actually, and I said this to you after I drove it, and not that I broke the NGA Ferrari. Um, <laughs> it was almost as if I thought the car felt that they dialed it out a bit, like weirdly heavy. Like do made you know the what steering mean? Like, a bit more heavier. Yeah, like it just wasn't as frantic. Yeah, like. It was immediate turning, great bite, Ferrari characteristics, but some Ferraris 
their steering rack and their feeling is so light and so quick. It's a bit like, whoa! Or, well, all of them, mate. All uh, of them. Uh, all the modern ones, they're all, it's so direct and so quick. And that's still there, but I just it just felt like it was at 97%. Okay. Rather than the, the usual 100. Yeah. Which I thought was quite nice. It felt a lot more controllable. Okay. Um, so steering, unbelievable. The big thing they made a big deal about, which I didn't really talk about in my piece, was the brakes, where they developed this thing called ABS Evo. Yeah. Which is really all about... Um, uh, Do I need that? Yes, you right. definitely. <laughs> like uh, cadence braking, or yeah, oh, yeah, 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 like, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially, not cadence oh, braking. I really like this car. What, what's, when um, you bleed off. Yeah, bleed yeah, off. Yeah. But there's a much better term for it. Why am I having a mind blank? No idea. When you break into the corner, and then you release off the brake as you're going into the. Come on. Oh, we're having. Fa- a- uh, Come on. Why are we being idiots? <sighs> anyway. The whole point of it is it's supposed to replicate way more like a like a race car. Yeah. So Mark Genet was a Formula One driver for a while, has been Ferrari's test and development and, and whatever driver for donkey's years. He said it's the closest he's felt in terms of brakes on a road car to a race car. Okay, fun. Uh, and the whole point is you're supposed to be able to lunge into these corners and modulate the brake pedal way more than any other road car um, to be able to really, yeah, just dive in late, bleed and off the And what about the brake. ABS? So this is what's called ABS Evo. Right. So it's a special technology. No, but does the a- ABS, because some, yeah, does the ABS uh, cut in early or, or does no. it really not? So that's the whole point. Right. The, the system is complex and, and I didn't really talk about it much because it's really aimed at track parts. Yeah, yeah. On the road, you can feel it, but you, you shouldn't really be lunging into corners that aggressively on the road, Tony. Um, <laughs> it's all about really on the track. And as I say, it's about being able to break basically into the apex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and they all, all that. yeah, they all really got excited about this. Only thing that I would say on track, and you can see it in my footage, as I'm hurtling towards the first corner at 270 kilometers an hour, <laughs> lol, <laughs> as I slam on the brakes, boy me, does the front of the car dive around a lot. You can really see on my footage like the car really pulled. Now this could be because we were midway through an international media drive of 300 odd media driving the car, the car being battered and twatted on track for a long time. Tires, which was yeah. the cup two R's that yeah. lasted about a lap and a half. Oh my God, they were a joke. Really? Literally a lap and a half and gone. Um, but yeah, the front of the car really sort of dived and pulled on, on the brakes. But, but but Ferraris do that, mate. Yeah, okay, fair they enough. Do... I very rarely drive Ferraris on track. Yeah, so. no, no, no. Just like if you drive a Ferrari really quickly yeah. under brakes, it will move about. They yeah. do move about. They're not like... Um, and one reason why I asked about the ABS is that sometimes the ABS can can come in a bit too quick on sure, a Ferrari. Sure, Porsche have got the best for brakes, for brakes. 100%. well I'll be interested to see what you think about this car when you get to have, have mm. a go um, fundamentally I thought it was brilliant I don't want one which I wasn't I mean I was a little surprised by because this is fundamentally the F8 replacement oh, um, no, they said it's not yeah they're like no 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 it's a new, whole new car <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't walk away going oh I love one of those which I often do with Ferraris and especially new Ferraris um but I thought it was really impressive. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like I, yeah, I, I yeah, really yeah. thought it was impressive and I really liked it, but I just didn't go, wow. Um, anyway, it was an amazing opportunity. I think most other journalists there were pretty blown away by it. The the tires being eaten up frustrated everyone. Um, the Cup 2 Rs, which come on the Assetto Ferrari car. On track. Yeah. So I think just the standard PS4Ss were probably better. The road car had great, ride quality on the road with the Assetto Fiorano cars you get much stiffer springs and so, bumpy road mode uh, not on the Assetto Fiorano right. car so okay. I would just if we're, I would just stick with the standard 296 save yourself 30 grand and wait for the Speciale Pista version if you really want something that's super dialed in um, the Fiorano pack I think doesn't make a lot of sense personally okay. um, even though it looks great so yeah uh, I'm trying to think one of the sort of stories or anecdotes came out of it N- not many interesting to see how Carfection and Auto Trader put their videos together how they film it very very impressive very incredible stumbled across uh, Henry and Rory filming sort of bits up on a road film their B-roll sequences oh, were they yeah super interesting to see they have like a film uh, yeah both of them had a videographers with them and they yeah. kind of teamed up together to sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, get, get all the bits they needed um, well, everyone was super nice like a really friendly bunch of, of journalists I have to say all or knew what they were talking about and just really nice people to hang out with. And yeah, it was, it was an amazing opportunity uh, and a really, really cool one. And, and I'm very grateful for it. And let's hope uh, that I get but you don't want a one. few more, but I don't want one. Yeah. If I, if I had, so 240 odd grand plus options here in the UK. So they're going to be two, 280, 300 normally because yeah. most people put 50 grand of options on a Ferrari so they will be around the 280 300 grand marks which is a few quid mate 
I I usually lean towards the mid-engine Ferraris. I would have an 812, not that you can go and buy one anymore, but I have an 812 over a 296. Okay. Personally. Fine. It just, yeah, I don't know. I, I really liked it. Maybe it's me and my Maybe lifestyle. Maybe you're going to change your mind because I, I could. Uh, you didn't could. like the RS6 two years ago. And <laughs> you do, so. Very good point. If only, I, if only I kept not liking it, I wouldn't have these fuel bills. Oh, God. If anyone wants a really nice green and tan RS6, by the way, to swap for a diesel McCann, get in touch because I might be interested in about a week's time. Um, anyway, well, look, it's uh, it's been good to catch up, Tony. Good yeah. to chat through these things. I say the episode didn't quite follow the path that I meant to, but when, did, when does it ever? Um, <laughs> stay tuned because very very shortly, we are going to be announcing our live events for this year. Lots of you keep asking, when are the next live events? When can we come and attend a Behind the Glass recording? We're going to be announcing those very soon. Patrons, you're going to be finding out first. We're going to be giving you the exclusive opportunity to get tickets before anyone else. So if you, like all of our existing patrons, want to hear those dates first, find out about the locations where the live events are going to be happening and buy yourself tickets, go and sign up to the Patreon page right now. Then you'll get that exclusive early access. But I would hope by the end of the month, we'll be able to announce at least some of the first dates for this year's Behind the Glass live events, which we're very excited about. We're very excited. Kind of all we've been looking forward to, yeah. isn't it? Um, so yes, anyway, for now, stay subscribed, turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes. If you're listening, keep uh, keep following us on Spotify or Apple. Can you subscribe on Spotify? I think you can. Subscribe, why not? <laughs> <laughs> you can like on Spotify. Yes, you can, actually. Yeah. Give, you know what? Give us a review. Yeah. Can you do, do that? you know why? We're 4.9 stars. We're not five. Why? What's that about? Who we've said like, no? We've had like 1,400 reviews, which is amazing. I think on Apple or Spotify, but we're at a 4.9 on Apple. We're 4.9 on Apple. So if you're listening to this now, give us a five stars. Just why not? Yeah. You know, yeah, we, if you think he's one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to follow Tony, he's at Tony Crumble Car Sales. I'm at Seen Through Glass on most social media platforms. And we'll be back with you for another episode next week. Bye-bye. See ya.